Uh, Zvinia Orlowski is a Pushcart Prize poet, an award-winning translator, and a founding editor of Four Way Books. She's published six poetry collections by Carnegie Mellon University Press, and her poem sequence, The Disenchanted Desna, was selected as a 2019 winner of the New England Poetry Club Samuel Washington Allen Prize. Her co-translations with Ali Kinsella from the Ukrainian of Natalka Bilotserkovitz's poems, Eccentric Days of Hope and Sorrow, was published by Lost Horse Press in 2021 and was a finalist for the 2022 Griffin International Poetry Prize, ALTA's National Translation Award in Poetry, the Derek Walcott Poetry Prize, and winner of the AAUS Translation Prize. She is writer in residence at the Solstice Low Residency MFA Program in Creative Writing and a contributing poetry editor to AGNI and Solstice Literary Magazine. Jeff Friedman's 10th book, Ashes in Paradise, will be published this year by Mad Hat Press. Friedman's poems and many stories have appeared in American Poetry Review, Poetry, Poetry International, New England Review, Flash Fiction Funny, Best Microfiction 2021 and 2022, and The New Republic. He has received an NEA Literature Translation Fellowship and numerous other awards. Meg Pokras and Friedman's co-written collection of microfiction, The House of Grana Padano, was published by Pelicanesis Press in April 2022. Phew, wonderful pedigrees. We're so happy to have you both with us and take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Helen, for that introduction. And thank you, Johnson County uh, Library community and Lisa Allen and all of you uh, for attending. And some of you are familiar uh, returning visitors. So thank you, yay, for that. Um, briefly, I am delighted to talk about this subject. I will be representing prose poetry, so to speak, in this conversation. And I couldn't be more happy um, to share share this conversation with Jeff Friedman, a friend of many decades, and also I can honestly say one of my favorite uh, poets, micro flash fiction, you name it, story writers. So it's really my pleasure um, to to co-host with him. How uh, we're going to do this is I um, we're going to alternate reading pieces, and hopefully you all receive the handout um, that Lisa sent. And we will hold off on questions at the end. Uh, we'll leave about 15, 20 minutes, but Jeff and I will ask each other questions and really try to narrow down what is the fine tooth distinguish, uh, uh, distinction between prose poetry and flash slash micro stories um, mm -hmm. with the caveat that we may not come to a conclusion. So just forewarning you <laughs> about that. Um, so getting started, Jeff, I'd love to invite you to read um, a first piece for us. Thanks. Um, well, thank you very much, um, Zavinia, for that. Um, and also, I love you. And we've been we've been working together for so long. And thanks, Helen, for that introduction and Lisa for having us. And um, it was fun listening to the introduction for Zavinia because I was sort of thinking to myself, boy, she's risen to such fame since she worked with me, you know. Absolutely. <laughs> Um, so anyway, yeah, I'm going to start out um, by reading a piece called My Mother's Dress Shop, which appeared in um, Best Microfiction 2023. And um, my mother had a dress shop uh, in downtown San Luis. Um, and she, she used to say that she sold sexy clothes. And um, it was the, the store was robbed so many times that, you know, she couldn't collect insurance on it. But um Anyway, so I, I, I'm going to read this, the, the piece and maybe we'll say something about it a little bit afterwards. Um, my mother's dress shop. Break down the boxes that held the clothing and stuff them into the dumpster in the alley behind the shop. Break down the racks that held the sexy dresses, the leather coats, the French lingerie until they are just rods and wheels lying in a corner. Fold up the clothing neatly. Break down the counter the shelves and the cash register, empty of cash. Break down the shadows that no longer hold voices. Break down the light that drops through the window like a message until it is just a scrap of light. Break down the dust that clings to the walls and counters that your mother attacks with a cloth and Windex. Break down the mannequins until they are disconnected limbs, head, and torso. Now there is only the memory of a memory, the striped cat leaping on the counter, its tail ticking back and forth, 
The nurses in white uniforms, peeking in the windows of air to spot a skirt or blouse on sale. Your mother's voice coming back to you like the smells of a fresh cinnamon sweet roll and steaming black coffee and the blaze of sun that makes it impossible to see. So I'll just add that I used to sometimes work at the store in the back breaking down boxes. So it wasn't difficult to get the breaking down. <laughs> So this is really a micro memoir, Jeff, is what you're saying, but we'll leave that. <laughs> yeah. I'm just kidding. Um, well, I, I just wanted to respond right away that if, if we were to just call this a flash fiction micro piece, then one of the characteristics that I would say right off the bat with these pieces, they uh, attempt to tell a story. You know, something happens, there may be a, you know, a, a climax resolution. But what they ask of the reader really is to pay very, very close attention, which I love and is typical for, for I would imagine, you know, we would think of that with poetry. Um, there are just, I just wanted to mention a few uh, places here. You've got all this like breaking down and all of a sudden in the middle of nowhere, there's this blip of fold the clothing neatly. And it's the opposite. It's like this interjection of a different voice, a different sentiment. And that keeps you on its toes. The same thing, the cash register, empty of cash. There's a sense of something that's meant to be full, but it is in fact empty. And then that segue into to something that's holding voices, which works beautifully, poetically, I will say with the uh, holding of cash. And then the ending just really squeezed my heart. I, I find it very moving. So in my bias, I would, um, you know, I, I feel there's so many like poetic elements here that I'm responding to. But my question to Jeff then is why flash fiction or micro fiction versus a prose poem for you in writing this? Or well, first of all, of course, I write a lot of um, poems and prose poems, you know, mm -hmm. so I came at it from that angle. But I think in this particular case, um, it, in my mind, this was a sort of um, a story about memory or how we try to remember things or how we break things down in memory. So the, the, the initial impulse was, um, was a story in my mind, you know, so, but I happen to tell the story using, uh, you know, parallelism and, and repeating phrases, but um, I, so it, it was a story about remembering the way we piece things together and then again, the way we recreate the memory and put it together. So really it's about a process there. So I guess that, I mean, it's difficult because I, it's, sometimes I feel like we should have a Venn diagram for all this, like where you have, prose poem on one side, flash story, and then the middle piece is somehow, it exists in a different category there. So, um, but yeah, I I, I think I, I I considered this from the start, a way of telling a story, but I mean, you know, um, also it was in best microfiction, so I don't want to argue with the editors. <laughs> <laughs> that, that kind of plays a little part in the whole thing. <laughs> so, no, not really. But I mean, you know, it, it, I sent it out originally to, um, uh, like the magazine I sent it out, I sent it out as fiction originally. But, you know, having said that, it's a blurred line there, you know. So, I mean, it's not, a, you know, like somebody, a lot of, some people might walk into it and read it and kind of go, well, this is a poem. You know, I could certainly see that response. Um, you know, so I, so in, in some ways, I think I'm making some distinctions that are, it's difficult to separate these two categories out. I mean, you could talk about the length of the pieces, you know, you could say flash, Flash story is three pages and under, as you could say, a micro story is maybe a page and under, or 300 words and under, or depending on how you're you're looking at it. But um, um, in in I want I'm addressing this as my own way of thinking about it, actually, and some of that has to do with intentionality, you know. So um, I hope I answered that question, or I talked long enough that everybody forgot the question. Either way. Um, I think I think I like I'd like to say you know as a member of the band now here's Zavinia so like, go ahead I finally stopped talking. <laughs> <laughs> oh thank you Jeff I'll take that as an invitation to read my my piece. Uh, I'm just going to jump in and read it. It's called Rolling. Late August, a black cat rolling in mown grass flips to its back again, then rolls to its feet, half sun drunk, half whiplash tail. I am loved, not, am. I've mastered these tricks at parties after my husband's break a leg, rolling an ice cube on my tongue, my eyes rolling over crowded rooms, 
my body buckled forward, rolling over rolling words, rolling my eyes, having blood drawn, the vial spilling slowly as flood water rising, rolling through one marriage, then breaking it off, holding up, each of us rolling away into our second marriages, pretending, yes, to be dead. So, um, I, you know, I, I love the, the rolling quality, you know, besides the fact it makes me think of the Tina Turner and how you used to tour with Tina Turner. So that was a, <laughs> no, I love the way rolling kind of just goes through the whole piece. There's a whole sense of it. So it really drives the poetry forward. And, but, you know, at the same time, it does tell a story. And um, it also uses summary in a very, you know, summary narration in a very, um, specific way and in a very good way. So I think you come out with all this, but I'm kind of just to take up, I mean, you're using, again, this is a piece that uses, um, is parallel and uses anaphora. Um, but I, 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 since I mentioned the intentionality, I'll ask you, I'll just go on with that question to you. Did you know this was going to be a prose poem when you started it? Um, that's a good question. The answer is um, absolutely not. I mean, this to me without question is a prose poem. I, I wouldn't, you know, consider it as a micro fiction. But where it actually came from is my mother, um, as, a, as a World War II refugee, you know, would mention these survival tactics, um, you know, where, where people during these mass massacres, it was roll, play dead until you can roll to safety. And I remember hearing that and just that always stayed with me, that whole concept of playing dead until you can roll to safety. And I started applying it to like jobs I didn't like and various things, you know, like I'm just going to play dead here until I can get out of the situation. But the poem, this actually started as a stanza poem, which I was, I was bringing in World War II, I was bringing in different things. And I didn't know where it was going. And, um, which is okay. And that's one characteristic of a prose poem. But the stanzas, the stanza breaks really put a stop on every rolling. So it's sort of like roll ka -chink, roll ka -chink, roll ka -chink. And I knew I knew I didn't want that. Um, could I put it in one monolithic long stanza? I, I couldn't have because when you do that, it tends to pick up the pacing. The rolling starts to roll yeah. faster and faster. And I didn't want that. I wanted all of these almost to be treated with equal weight, whether we're right. talking about rolling ice in your mouth or you're talking about a divorce. And so prose poem, the long horizontal prose line worked perfectly because everything could just move smoothly until it came to that ultimate image for me, which was the initial reason I wanted to write this was this pretending to be dead only I applied it to a marriage that has gone. Yeah. And, and there's a sense of that, uh, the rolling through your history, that's why it's a good mm -hmm. metaphor. And it, it's really driven by a metaphor, you know, like the idea of rolling, yeah. and taking through this whole this whole thing. So um, yeah, um, this is, I've always really liked this poem. I've admired what it, uh, how much it does in such a short space, which is another, the compression of it adds to the mm -hmm. sort of wisdom yeah, the, it was kind of like marriage. <laughs> yeah, well, kind of going through your first marriage. I'm well, sorry. But, you can talk about that on the side later in the phone call. Right? Things, things better forgotten. But um, on that lead in, Jeff, I'd like to invite you to read Lost Memory. I can't remember that. Um, okay. Um, so, um, well, okay. Um, to, to say, I just, to get, to preface it, I mean, it's a little, this piece is a little bit about who owns the memory and how, again, how we change memory, what happens to it. But really, this actually started um, I, uh, with an argument I had with my sister about um, who had double pneumonia and when they had it in our family. So we had an argument about one of us had one or maybe two of us had double pneumonia and one or maybe two of us missed a whole year of school and one or two of us maybe had our mother cook all this pound cake and and these strudel and all this for all the kids coming over in the class. So we had this argument about it. So I kept trying to write a piece about it. And I just said, well, the hell of it, I can't take it literally. So I just wrote a kind of fun piece that had to, that, that, that put memory at the center and the blue jar uses blue jar. So um, lost memory. My sister stole a memory of mine from my house and took it home, hidden in her coat. I couldn't remember the memory, but there was an empty space on the sideboard under the window. Give me back 
the memory, I said, standing outside her door, and I won't report you to the authorities. She let me in. Don't be ridiculous, she said. Why would I steal a memory of yours? Didn't take me long to find the memory, a blue jar sitting on the glass stand between two chairs. When I picked it up, she looked puzzled. This is my place, she said. These are my things. Not true, I replied and unscrewed the lid. Emptiness wafted out with its stinging scent. Now I remembered something I had wanted to forget. I screwed the lid back on quickly and set it down. That's my memory, she said. You shouldn't have opened it. Then what do you remember, I asked. Nothing. It's gone because you let it out. And as I stood there, angry at my sister, the scent of the memory evaporated. And all I could remember was the jar. And now that belonged to her. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I, this actually thinks a good, uh, good time to bring in dialogue, uh, because as we try to differentiate, I mean, we've just in the first two poems, we've kind of seen that um, uh, instead of line breaks, the sentence is privileged, and you can really stretch out, you know, the syntax and have the syntax move to these unexpected places. Um, and uh, also, you know, we've seen how how there is a story behind each of these pieces, even if the story is more prominent or more easily identified, and then if it's more deeply hidden through metaphor. But Jeff, with this one specifically, um, would you consider that dialogue is a more of a characteristic of micro or flash fiction than prose poetry? Because I know I don't, I rarely use any speech or dialogue in my prose poems and you yeah, I'm, a lot. That's an interesting question. I mean, because there is, you know, the, the prose poem breaks down into a number of different categories, but one of them would be the surreal narrative. And like somebody like Russell Letson certainly has a lot of dialogue in his pace. James Tate would be another person with, um, but I do, I do think, you know, when I, this one more clearly than the other one falls into the fictional category. And um, I think, you know, I I probably do start a piece like this in my mind. It's triggered by some interaction with another person in a dialogue. So that probably is the the beginning point, the the kind of triggering point um, for a, a piece like this. I mean, and in this case, it, it's about memory, but it's also about remembering something may not be so good because you might want to forget some of what you mem remember. But but it, you know, it, it's difficult. Uh, yeah, I think. But I think there really are a lot of prose poems out there that um, that use dialogue and maybe they create a kind of ry rhythm with the dialogue. For me, I, I feel like when I'm writing a poem, I there's something about the music of it is at the center of it. There's some rhythmic aspect that takes over um, mm -hmm. that I can recognize. Um, you know, I might have said something different a few years ago, but I, there's something rhythmic that that really takes over in my mind. That doesn't mean, like I said, the last one, there's definitely something rhythmic in that piece I just read, Give Me Back, you know, The Mother's Dress Shop. But 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 I mean, in creating it, I'm hearing the, I'm hearing a certain kind of rhythm in the in the poem that, mm -hmm. that that carries over. Whereas with the story, I think oftentimes I'm in dialogue with somebody in the story, you know, you. you know, so that that, you know. That's where that's where it kind of begins, I guess. But that doesn't mean the first line is going to be dialogue. That just means maybe the whole thing uh, generated from a piece of dialogue or from an interaction with, mm -hmm. with somebody else. You know, like I said, this was about something that happened between me and my sister. You know, so um, that that's where it came from. You know. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, well, let's go on. To, let's let's move on to your another piece, which is, um, you know, shorter, kind of compressed. Yeah, novel. yeah. Um, this one is called the fortieth day, and it does have the Genesis and the biblical reference. And and for me, it was the Eastern Orthodox, and in some in some uh, sects of Catholicism, the idea of the soul wandering for forty days before she he, they find eternal rest. Um. I'll read it. The fortieth day. The fortieth day called forth a night of a different kind of brilliance when the moon wrapped everything with light, trumpeting yellow pumpkin blossoms, a water pump with a dropped handle resembling a rusty beard, 
an old chainsaw depression at the top of a tree stump, things just outside her window that spoke with feeble or hoarse voices. A minute passed, then another. Old roses opened fearless and a beautiful on this day of sadness. Since flowers were no longer just flowers, they blurred and stretched into transparent curtains, walking in the breeze of the raised storm window, walking for those of us left behind. So, oh, go ahead. You want to say something? No, no go ahead. It's your poem. I mean, you know, okay. Um, I, I shouldn't take over, but uh, I, I, of course, I love this one too, but this is also about trying to hold on to something, you know, it's a final moment actually. And I like the way you, you know, we don't really see the, in the final moment, there's just all of a sudden everything around that final moment, you sort of created the air around that moment of the person. So you, you've done that in a lovely way. And then um, there, it, you know, it moves from image to image, um, but it also kind of, it, it also sets a scene and does tell a story. I'm wondering, one thing I really kind of wonder, because I know in my work, um, I was really greatly influenced growing up by biblical narratives, particularly in Genesis, you know, the, the, the poetic prose of the Bible. And I'm wondering how the Bible or how, if that's informed, I mean, 40 days, you could look at the 40 days and nights of rain, you know, is that informed, how is that kind of story or is anything informed your work here and informed the creation of, the, of this well, poem? Definitely, definitely in, in this poem, because, um, you know, I was taking, there's so many meanings to, you know, 40 and the 40th day in the, in the, in the Bible, et cetera. And, you know, there's the reference to the flood. Uh, and then there's the references I mentioned to the soul wandering before uh, finding final rest. And I guess my feeling was that, and this was, this was written for my mother who passed, um, that, you know, how long can I hold on to her? How long and in what ways will she show that she's moving around. And I tried to show in kind of a, a mystical way how the outside was changing or how, you know, you have this object, this water pump, which I guess, yeah, you know, it's a little bit of reference to water or flood uh, resembled a rusty beard. So there's this blurring. And I wanted very much um, for these images to kind of blur um, as the soul left the earth. In terms of, um, tone i've one of my favorite pieces has always been a, what i call a prose poem by mark strand called the arrival of a mysterious letter i believe that's the accurate a title where the speaker doesn't understand there's this letter that's arrived on a table and he doesn't he doesn't know how it got there and then his father has passed and he picks up this letter and the letter begins to say dear son and then nothing so it's like he gets so close to having something in a mysterious way from his father, but then there's nothing there. And it reminded me like sometimes when we dream, and this has very much kind of a dreamscape to it, that the harder we squint, the more we want to see more clearly what's going on, it blurs out. The way that like, if you dream about a letter and you're really trying to read it, you're never going to read it. At least I, I never do. But um, so it was like that, that moment of where, where my mother actually, I felt I wished her to take on a physical presence. And the way that I could do it was to imagine her walking with these white curtains that billowed in, in her apartment. She used to love these white curtains and she referred to them as the way they would walk across the floor. Uh, so I was trying to capture that. And also with the reference to Mark Strand's piece, the um, Somebody had actually written in a card uh, attached to flowers that they sent to my family, to my sister and me, fearless and beautiful on this day of sadness. And I thought that that was such a unusually poetic and lovely thing for somebody to write versus condolences or, you know, the, the general thing that people feel comfortable saying. So I wanted to, to work that in, but it's really like a mood a mood piece that moves until it satisfies me, which is, okay, she's walking in those curtains. I'll take it. <laughs> you know, I'll take yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, you answered the question. I think like, you, you know, I think you did. <laughs> I think I did too. <laughs> I'll, I'll listen to the recording and I'll be, oh, you've yeah, got to try to answer the yeah. question. Um, 
Well, thank you. So, Jeff, I'd like to invite you to read Bear Fight. Well, those who attended a previous class, the workshop, I already, spoiler alert, read it on oh. your behalf, but I think you'd be all the more wonderful to hear it in your voice. Okay. Well, I'm. this is a piece for sure that started with uh, um, a, you know, a piece of dialogue. Um, and also, you know, I, I think I was greatly influenced growing up by Woody Allen. So there's a, there's a way in which that plays a part here. And then um, um, the, the piece of dialogue that triggered this was my close in eighth grade, my, my best friend at the time, he went out with this girl uh, for one week. And then when he went away, I ended up going out with her for one week. And then when we got back, we both ended up at her house. And, and the, the, the triggering thing was, I'm sick. Basically, I'm sick of you two. Get out of here. <laughs> that was a piece of dialogue, which I remembered all these years, you know. But so th somewhere in the back of this, it's, it was that. But also, you know, I have bears in my driveway, bears in the trees. So we've had a lot of experience with bears, bears coming into the carport. And I just want to mention one thing. I know wolves huff. Well, at least in fairy tales and and in uh, fables, but 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 bears, uh, bears huff quite loudly, so you can hear them pretty far away. So anyway, uh, this is called Bear Fight. Um, when Liza fell in with a bear, I was more than disappointed, as I had been in love with her since childhood. What's he got that I don't? I asked as we walked past the diner together. He's a bear, she said. She let go of my hand. He gets a little jealous when I'm out with my friends. Why do you want to be with a bear anyway, I asked. Two teenagers pushed past us with their skateboards. Balloons floated above Main Street, announcing a sale at the furniture shop. Why do you want to be with me, she asked. We parted ways when the light changed. But later, I went to her home dressed as a bear. She opened the door. Come in, she said, putting her arms around me. You don't smell like a bear, she said. Then... In walked the bear with a fierce look on his face. He growled and so did I. He cuffed me, so I cuffed him back. Then we grappled with each other, bear hugging until Liza stepped in between us and held out her hands. I'm sick of bears, she said, get out of here. I ripped off my bear mask. I'm not a bear, I said. The bear ripped off his. I quit this game, he said, I'm not a bear either. Liza removed her mask and she wasn't Liza. We ran away as fast as we could. I made it back to my place and locked the door, turning on the outside light. But all night, I heard her huffing. I love that piece. Thank you, Jeff. Um, Jeff, would, under any circumstance, you consider this a prose poem? Because this, to me, very much is a, a flash fiction piece or micro. I might consider it a prose. If, for example, if the Nobel Committee was going to put it in a or uh, was going to put in an anthology of prose pieces, I post poems, I would just say, oh yeah, I had that in mind. You no, know, I, well, you know, I mean, I think I read, I, again, the triggering impulse here was to tell the story about, um, about these, well, to tell the story about the somebody falling in love with a bear and not the bear not being the person she thought and or the other person not being the person he or she thought. So that was the impulse behind to tell a little story here and to do it fairly compressed in a way. I mean, it does have a poetic compression to it, I think. You know. Um, it does. Okay. It, you know, so I, yeah, I mean, but again, this is another one. I mean, it's about masks and outward appearances, but it's another one that, like I said, at the beginning, it really began, um, it really began with dialogue. And you can start to tell when I start to get more story-like because I start saying, he said, she said a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway, so I won't belabor that point. But um, let's go um, the let's go to damaging wind, which is a lengthy prose poem. Um, it it is. Uh, I'll read it very quickly. Um, no, you can read it slowly. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I actually want. I was delighted to read this because in our I don't know Brooke if you're here. Brooke uh, was in our work workshop and she wrote a piece called wind like this and it was mentioned that it was interesting because the wind actually took on an active role in having these certain things happen in the poem and I thought oh I'm so glad of reading this because um this uh, this takes that subject uh, in a different direction but also is very wind inspired uh so it's called damaging wind wind hid in the forest seasons came and went 
but there were no signs of devastated towns, no boarded restaurant windows or collapsed porches, no chimes tinkling in the breeze. Some suspected the wind herself was damaged. Wind's father had been a boozy hurricane, her mother a heated argument between lovers in a cold motel room. But what was her calling card? An overturned flower pot, a torn kite lying in tall grass, pages rustling in an open, unread book. Occasionally, a shingle flapped on a neglected barn roof or a heavy, damp branch dropped on a neighbor plucking long mushrooms after days of rain. But no one stood outside and said, the wind is going to be nasty tonight. No one replied, tell it to the wind. Nearly forgotten, Wynne considered staging a comeback. She could ruin a birthday party with flying debris or chase off clowns who were trying to take over the neighborhood. She could even make them tumble. She could slap power lines onto asphalt roads, but pushing a car off the road often left her gasping. Hoping to gain more visibility, she tweeted a picture of herself as a fully erect windsock. This got her three followers. You're the butt of all jokes, the leaves rustled. You're just a flash of color, wind muttered defensively, then a crumbled bit of nothing. Shamed, wind mimicked dog whistles. Silenced, she became a shot of rum, a blown over kiss, a mouth puckered in the hot, still air. So, I mean, this is interesting to me because, um, I, I mean, I really like the piece, but it's also interesting because you're long, the pieces you included are actually the longer pieces are longer than the stories. And yet, in this case, um, you know, personification is sort of leading the way. And then it, it is very parable like, actually, too. So I'm wondering, you know, it seems like in your longer pieces, you you use sections or you break things up into sections. and I don't know, is is that because you feel the the you know the poem aspect of your piece is getting out of control, or is that to how do you use that in terms of the shaping of your work? I uh, and you use sections quite a bit um in longer pieces. I'm not because I know your work pretty well. So um I I like working in sections because they allow for shifts and they allow for shifts in terms of like tone or any lyric narrative that may be going on or um you know, what, just different perspectives. And they kind of show the piece in, in, in the organic process. This one for me, I brought up, first of all, I thought I wanted to match it with yours in terms of identity and masking identities, only taking this to a natural source, which is the wind pretending to be or hoping to be something she isn't, uh, which I thought would work well with the bear mask. But I will agree in this one, this is probably closest or closer to a short, a micro flash fiction story than a prose poem because it does create sort of a introduction and then a middle and then a resolution where where the, the wind kind of gives up or becomes something else. But I still think for me, it's more in the prose poetry because even though something happens, you know, this projection of, oh, I'm going to disrupt this birthday party, or I'm going to do this, or I'm going to do that. It still is image-led, image by image by image. And I think that sometimes the, the reason that I break up things is because I feel if they're very image-heavy, it's a lot for a reader to take in. So I definitely want that pause and then break onto the next one, into the next one, allowing sure. myself to move it into a different direction. Um, well, I mean, I, also... If, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. You were going to say it. Well, I was going to say, but it's rare to me that I have the wind and the leaves sort of um, having a little this mini, mini dialogue because I, I don't really do that a lot um, mm. in my writing. So that would be closer, I think, to flash fiction. But in terms of it seems like, Jeff, in some of the micro stories that there is more of like a protagonist and an antagonist on some level. And um, at least in mine, I don't know that. Yeah, yeah. And um, but here the protagonist would be the win. But at the same time, she's almost the antagonist as well, because it's her lack of belief in what she can do, with the exception of those last nasty leaves that prevents her from becoming the presence and a little bit of a Lorca piece or something, you know, with a like that back to the, you know, there's, there's the songs where the wind is talking or the moon is, you know, like an early the ballads or something. Yeah. 
it, it has that quality. I'm sorry, did, were you going to add more to that? No, I mean, no, not at all. As a matter of fact, we're, I want to make sure that we do have time for a Q&A. So I was so thinking... Um, can I add one more thing about that? Because yeah, yeah, what please. you were saying... Yeah, because I was thinking like all the way back to... I mean, it's it's really difficult to... You know, if you go back to the early, like the, the 19th century in Baudelaire, let's say, um, really... A lot of, I mean, he had these tremendously poetic pieces, but he also had these long, almost story, like three or four page pieces to go with it. And of course, and Rimbaud also in Illumination. And Spain of the two, yeah. absolutely, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so there, yeah, so sometimes those distinctions, you know, like as to, I mean, the, the terms themselves can be, and we also have a lot of poets writing micros, a lot of, and a lot of fiction writers writing poems, you know, and people who consider them both, you know, who do both very well. And some of them are in the audience, actually. So um, anyway, but go ahead and take it over. You were going to say something more. Uh, no, I was going to say, Jeff, we should, so that we have ample time for Q&A. Did you want to read one more and we'll each oh. read one more and then we'll open it up? Yeah, sure. I'll I'll, I'll do one more. I'll do a another, I'll do another relationship piece or a fabulous piece. I'll stay away from my sort of political pieces. Um, so this one's called White Feather. Um, and it, um, you know, it, it, well, I'll just read it. Um, after Alexandra kissed me, a white feather flew out of my mouth. I pretended that nothing out of the ordinary had happened, though the feather floated between us for a long while before it fell on the carpet. The feather was long and bowed with soft fringe. I wanted to pick it up and twirl it, but Alexandra seemed concerned. Did you eat a white bird, she asked. I shook my head. It's only one feather, I answered. She eyed me suspiciously, though a moment before she had seemed perfectly happy to be kissing me. To prove that there was no problem, I kissed her and everything was fine. Our lips met, our tongues touched and tangled as they had a thousand times before. Then another feather floated from my mouth and stuck in her thick black hair. She pulled it out and scrutinized the feather for a long time. There's something inside you trying to get out, she said. You have to do something about it. What can I do, I said. It's only two feathers. She picked up her journal and began writing. Now I was alarmed. Had I done something to deserve this? Had a bird flown into my mouth in a dream? I thought about my dreams, but couldn't remember anything particular. Let's try one more kiss, I said. But this time a white dove flung itself from my mouth flying wildly around the room until it hit the window and fell on the floor. Is it dead, I asked. She kneeled and cradled the dove in her arms. Then she carried it outside. I thought to bury it, but instead she threw it in the air. The dove caught itself before plummeting into the pavement and landed on a branch above us. We'll figure this out, she said, squeezing my hand, but I could already feel a tickling in my throat as the dove began singing. Clearly, there's an influence of the fable in this. So, um, which uh, I'll take it over. Thank you, Jeff. I'll just ask one quick question um, here, which does it doesn't require a quick answer, I'm sure. But like with this piece, it's so rich and complex and beautiful. What was the lead-in for this? I mean, you mentioned a, a parable, a parable. I'm sorry, a fable, or was it the image fable. of a feather? Or how did you enter? Like, what was the entering point? Well, this. I think I, I, you know, besides, like I said, a lot of my work being informed by fables and and tales, that um, the first line after Alexander kissed me, a white feather flew out of my mouth. I knew, you know, I'm norm, I'm oftentimes writing in the kind of realm of fabulism, you know, like sort of surreal, something happening that's out of the ordinary. And in this case, it just came out like that. And so I said, well, I'll just follow it, see what happens. Yeah. Well, you followed it you know, beautifully. Um, I'll I'll read one more and then we'll open up to Q and A, um, Jeff. Because you mentioned sequential, um, this one also has is a sequential poem, and I just wanted to briefly say that um, uh, the reason this is a prose poem for me is that at the end, when there should be some sort of conclusion, I let the writing almost dissolve into language and music. So it's kind of like it doesn't where it's supposed to pull together and make that something happen, I just, I go the prose poetry way and just let let the, the rhymes and the alliteration um, and the music kind of take over. Um, so I'll, I'll read this. Night rain. 
I thought grandmother was a delicate type, a fragrant phantom who floated into my room every night to check my breath. Not a woman who smoked and religiously watched Friday night fights. Curly clouds filled the living room, surrounded her. She dragged her camel cigarette, tapped ashes into a drinking glass. On the TV, a rowdy crowd cheered. Three bells concluded the end of a round. One man strikes a lucky blow, the other falls down. Who doesn't love a man who gives himself up? More than amateur boxing, she favored visits with priests. One brought kielbasa and vodka. His forgiving eyes said sin was like rain, both absolved in nature. In the next room, my grandmother brought her own nature. She folded her apron, a rosary coiled into a tiny snake in one of its pockets, crossed the straps, patted her hair. She unfastened one glass button, a black ladybug nested high between the leaf spreads of her collar. Just before her death, grandmother dropped like a felled tree onto the floor of our living room. I woke to my mother's screams to a dream of our house burning. Attendants guided her covered body on a stretcher. At the cemetery, my father said, be very quiet. Having missed you so much, hearing your voices might just kill her again. She'd insisted grandchildren's voices were of an angelic choir. The silent ones needed the most cradling. Was I one of the angelic, one of the more silent ones? Sad music crackled through the funeral home speakers like fire. Never again did God bleed summer rain, offer me nights of sunset stain. Song swapped for a straight to the back of the throat shot of vodka, a mute peel of lavender pebble shaped rosary beads. Asked who in the end wins. No one answers. A bell didn't ding. Tobacco dried up, left the ring. That's a lovely piece. I mean, but you could say, I might beg to disagree with you on that one. What didn't happen did happen actually at the end. So something did happen actually as went on. So it always happens. So I think, I think, I mean, you could, I mean, this one really does tell, I mean, it's really in the story category to me, you know, so, but I mean, again, you, you have a right to define your own. Absolutely. But it definitely has an, it definitely has a move at the end to it. So lovely ending, but. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it is a quarter after. We'd love to answer any questions. Uh, please feel free to, to jump in or if you feel more comfortable putting a question in chat. Um, please any do. questions we can answer, we'll answer. That's true. I'm sure Jeff will answer all of them. Brilliant. I might just answer another question if you ask a question again. <laughs> um, so. I have a question. Yes. Yes, I, uh, who's um, at, I can't, maybe, a, please speak up. <laughs> Annie, I think your connection is unstable. People bought Would you want to put it in the chat? You drop it in the chat, because yeah. we can't hear you. Put it in the chat. Um, Courtney has sent in a question that maybe you can answer while Annie is working out her issues. Okay. Um, the difference between microfiction and flash fiction is what? Length. I'll answer that. Um, you don't mind. It's simple. I mean, it, 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 all these came about when this series of anthology came out. And uh, the first one, one of the first ones was called Sudden Do you Fiction. want me to? And okay, that, I'll put it in the chat. Okay, so uh, there was like five, I think sudden fiction was five pages and under, then there was flash fiction, three pages and other. And Jerome Stern put out the microfiction anthology, which at the time I think he said was 250 or 300 words. And then Robert Scottolero, who's here today, he and um, I think James Thomas did the new micro. And I think they had a little longer um, length requirement or was it 250, Robert, 300? So it was a, so three, you know, so the flash story is usually considered 750 or less. And then um, 
And then Robert, please define, because since you were the editor of the of the new micro, what was the length that you went on? Can you put it in the chat? 300, 350. <laughs> Sounds like, uh, well, I can get the book. It's right around here, but it, it's a, I think it, it it's very simply a length distinction, you know? So uh, like, I think Meg's book, Best Microfiction, is those are 400 and less. And, um, I'll go get the new micro and check that out. But anyway, that's a, that that's a that's a simple answer to the question. Um, a good answer, Jeff. I'm looking here. Um, could you give us a type of cheat sheet to distinguish the difference between prose poetry and microfiction? Um, that's a tough one. That's a tough one to answer. I would say, I actually um, taught a workshop years ago with a, fic a fiction writer and we were going to agree between us how what is the basic difference and she suggested and I agreed with it at that time was that in a story something happens so you've got the story element in there but the reason and I think that if you're looking for broad base you know you're going to have a story there's a beginning there's an exposition there's a you know a climax there's a you know there's a build up a climax somewhat of a conclusion even if that conclusion is that there's no conclusion but I the reason that even a, a basic definition like that for me doesn't work is because in with emotions something happens it doesn't have to be that this person got up and left or that person punched that one. It's, it's um, to me, the something happens can be, um, you know, can be a revelation. I mean, when James Wright writes about, you know, writing and the, and the, uh, you know, the, the little spider crawls on his, on his hand and he says, you know, I wish I could be one mountain this spider could depend on, but I must keep moving or I will die. There is really no story. I mean, you know, there's the stories that the spider gets on him, but the story doesn't doesn't go on to that. The story then turns into a prince, or the story, or he smashes it, or whatever. It triggers a change in him. So I think with any poetry, any poetry, we process something, and then something happens. We're transformed by that journey, and the writing of the poem becomes that boom. And I feel that's very similar with flash fiction. I do agree with Jeff that prose poetry tends to be, you know, maybe one one paragraph that has a lot of music, a lot of, you know, um, a lot of surreal elements. If you're feeling like you want a lot of things going on and they don't really make sense, but they somehow work together, that would be more in the realm, I think, of prose poetry. But Jeff, you might agree. I mean, if anything, we're we're saying that these genres do do blur, and I I I wouldn't worry too much if you get it right. But I but for me, a story does have dialogue. It has sort of the more story elements present. Well, Jeff, so I, I oh, that or disagree. Well, I mean, there's a, I you know it's different. By the way, let me just say that in New Micro, I think it was one page or less was the defining. So flash fiction was three pages and less and new and um, and new micro had it one page or less and, and the old micro fiction had one page or less as well. Um, but um, that definition was expanded in best micro fiction. I think that in um, to 350 words or 400, I can't remember which one, but um, the, um, you know, there, there are many types of pro prose poems um, there was the, like I said, the surreal narrative, but there's also sort of the language prose poem or the poems that are concerned with grammar in some way and different aspects. And there a lot, there's a lot of experimenting going on. And I found myself when I was judging various um, flash fiction slams or, you know, that that was the argument that continually happened. Like the story writer stuck pretty closely to the idea of like it's got to have it, it has to have a little plot or it has to have something something has to happen in it and um but i i, I since there's so many po poets writing i think if you writing micros when you go through the anthologies in actuality um you know in actuality you will see some that really look that act and look a lot like prose poems that, that are in the micro stories and then the, the same is true on the other end of it so um, it's hard to 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 have an exact 
fast rule, but, you know, they come from different traditions. That's one of the big things, like, you know, the, the flash story and the micro story come from the story writing tradition and the prose poem actually comes from a, you know, a whole different way of thinking about things. So they sort of meet in the middle and keep crossing over. So, um, I, and so it might be right. I mean, um, again, it might be right to try to hold that idea of, of at last something changes in the world. But, you know, you find that in a lot of poems too as well. So it, it may not, it's just not an easy, it's not an easy thing. And and like I said, you'll see like something like Carolyn Forche's uh, The Colonel appearing in a prose poem anthology and in a micro story and a flash fiction anthology and in a regular poetry anthology. So I, I think that's a, a good point. There's a couple more questions here. Um, oh, sorry, Ron yeah. had said, does the difference even matter? Isn't the form just a tool to say what is needed? And I would agree, does the difference even matter? I, um, I, I'm going to say, you know, in uh, decades ago, with, when uh, when I was with Four Way Books, we published Stephen Berg's Shaving, which I know very well because he couldn't provide a floppy disk. So I typed out the entire manuscript for him, I, you know, freshly. So I got to know him very well. And those were those were absolutely short stories for me. But then Louise Gluck, I believe it was, said, this is the hallmark of prose poetry. Um, actually, I don't think it was Louise Glick. Oh, forgive me, I'm blanking out here, but it was it's right on on um, you know, the cover. So it's the type of thing that I believe as you pursue one or the other, as Jeff was saying, there's a tradition that that comes for one and a tradition that comes to other with prose poetry. You know, you're going to be looking back to Rambo, Folan, all those writers, and it's who moves you. And I would just write what you write. And when you submit to magazines, it's trial and error. Um, I've had things published in fiction magazines that I then included in a book of poetry. It goes back and forth. And having worked as an editor, and we all know this, if an editor wants a piece of work from you and that prose poem was just taken by another anthology, they'll take your flash fiction and put it in their prose poetry. You know, so it's, you know, I use that term, the Wild West. Um, I think there's certain characteristics, but I think it's a slippery slope. And I think you should just call and write what you feel a greater affinity for. Um, and then I, I'm sorry, there's other, oh, uh, for, so I was wondering if you- Yeah, first... there's definitely other questions, but you know, there's that uh, question about, can I want to address that one for one sure. second? Yes, sure. of course it matters because we're giving a talk on it. After the talk, it won't matter so much. But during the talk, there, I mean, to some extent, all of this is provisional. You know, you kind of come up with some definitions and try to talk about it as a way of entering just what a piece of literature or a piece of prose or a piece of poetry is actually doing. So it, it's 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 a template for the moment to kind of consider something or a way of, of looking at it. You know, um, and, and like I'm sure Zavinia or both of us could probably tomorrow kind of turn around and look at it in a whole other way. You know what I mean? Or you might you might um, go and look at it and consider it in a different angle from other, in a, in a, on a different day, you know, in a different day. But but it, it's it's useful to try to get some, to, to try to get some some clarity on something that, that all sorts of people are writing and at the same time, not to go crazy trying to do it, you know? Right. Um. Thank you. It was the question. I'm wondering if your first book were prose poems. Oh, thank you for asking. Uh, actually, no, they were very tight lyric poems, but the very first piece that I ever wrote and was published was a prose poem. And um, and I would say with like my most recent book, uh, Bad Harvest, the first section is entirely prose poems, and then it's lyric stanza poems. And for me, what and this is the difference between poetry and prose poetry is if I feel that I want to tell a story more, then it goes into the paragraph form. Uh, otherwise, I'm, I'm an image hound and I tend to pare back as much as I can. I hope that answered the question. I don't want to. Um, very good question. Very good question. Young woman. Right, and the answer, Jeff, come on. Come on. Oh, whether it was for you. I mean, I, in my first. What, no, you, absolutely, Jeff. I, I, I was just praising the question. I thought it was a lo lovely question. How um, about you, Jeff? Well, how about I mean what? How how was your first pro your first? No, well, I mean, I, I wrote a long time before I started in fiction, actually. So I mean, I was intending to write a novel, but it got shorter and shorter till it was like one sentence. So <laughs> <laughs> no, I switched to poetry at some point, but um I was writing like little paragraphs. A, a lot, but I just didn't, you know, and then at some point, 
the uh, verse took over. And then at some point, I just, the paragraph took over and I've just been doing that since that time. I haven't, in years, I, I've only written a couple of verse poems in the last, I don't know, 10 years. They're mostly all been uh, in, you know, prose poems or micros. Um, that, that's my book, Floating Tales, which I read a piece from Bear Fight. That's all, it's all prose. It's not, all you know, prose. prose. Well, I, you know, looking because we're getting right up to the the hour, um, Jeff. Why don't we both offer three? We seem we're agreeing with the fact that they blur, and mm. there's no way that we can come out of them saying they don't blur. They will blur. But Jeff, what? Um, just name three things, and I'll try to do with prose poetry that, if you had to say, would be characteristic of a flash fiction, a micro fiction story, just to give some guideposts here. Uh oh. Um, well, okay. So you're going to have something. Uh, you're going to have something telling a story, a movement, a movement, an arc. You're going to have. Some, well, I hate to use that word. You're going to have some sort of motion and a character interacting with something, and something's bound to happen or change in the world of that story. So that that would be characteristics of a story. I think the the first microfiction collection really didn't adhere. So, there were a lot of pieces that didn't adhere. The new one really does sort of adhere to that uh, that kind of guideline where something's happening i believe um that they're pretty much more there are very few pieces in there that i would characterize as prose poems in in that so that that's did i say three things because i'm not a good at math okay <laughs> that'll work okay so six things. quickly three things for prose poetry i would say compressed thought and intensity an emphasis on um music alliteration, assonance, so that the language and the rhythmic part is the most important thing, um, uh, one of the most important things. And, you know, a bit of arsenic, as they say, a bit of mystery and surprise that um, even though something happens, it might be more in the, I'm not going to say that, in the emotional realm. But if you allow yourself to get out there more and lose the thread of a story, Perhaps I would say that that's more prose poetry. But anyway, we hope that that's helpful. We want to respect the. Yeah, I mean, I just sort of, I mean, you're kind of, a, I'm a storyteller as well. But, you know, so it comes together because poems tell stories as well. But, you know, I know when I'm, I, I kind of know when I'm telling a story. <laughs> and I guess, you know, when you're telling, when you're writing a poem, so. And maybe use the <laughs> heavier use of dialogue. I would, maybe, I would say be more of. Yeah, that's thing. probably true, but not, you know, not entirely. Not exactly. but yeah. Yeah. So I, I hope we've cleared up nothing for you, but um, <laughs> no, I'm just teasing. I mean, it's, it's interesting. I hope we've, we've, we've shed some light on it anyway, or brought some different ideas into the, into it, you know, that might be useful um, in thinking about it. Well, and I want to thank both of you, Zvenia and Jeff, for being with us this evening. That was a really enjoyable an informative conversation. I, I'm not even going to attempt to, to, to <laughs> yeah, I know what the difference is, but I, I, it really gave us a lot to think about. And I appreciate that. We appreciate you taking the time to be with us. And Zvinia, thank you for being with us last week and this weekend. Thank and you. I want to thank all of you for participating and being here. Thank and to let you know that next month, the Johnson County Library will be offering a generative poetry workshop with Tracy Brimhall, the Poet Laureate of Kansas, to develop or polish your poetry writing. And these are going to be three different dates. You just choose one of them. And it does require registration. And you can find information about this and other library programs on the library's website at jococlibrary.org slash events. You can also find information for writers on the library's website on their For Writers page. So thank you all. This has been wonderful. Thank, thank you for being you. here. And enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. And thank you all for coming. Thank you for coming. And thanks for bringing thank your you. prose poems, Zavinia. <laughs> and, your, and your flash fiction, micro fiction, prose poems. <laughs> Everybody have a good evening, Lorraine. Thank you for showing. So, Kathy for the nice question. Celia, my sister Vicky was here, and Elise was mm -hmm. here. So, and Robert, of course, who I'm going to be talking to about getting a definition there about the fiction more clear. I'm. I want to hear what he has to say to me later. About <laughs> Thank you. Thank good you. night, everybody. Night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.